I am not Thomas Homer Dixon. I am the mayor of the city of Victoria. Uh, Tad has had a power outage, if you can believe it, and will be uh, joining us just as soon as possible. But in the meantime, we're going to do our best to uh, pinch hit and uh, moderate without him. Uh, before we begin the panel, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that here in the city of Victoria, which is where I am right now, uh, we are on Lekwungen territory. Uh, those are the homelands of the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. Uh, these are their lands and have been for uh, time immemorial. And just really want to acknowledge uh, with deep gratitude the generosity of the nations for welcoming uh, those of us who have arrived here more recently uh, and continuing to welcome us with generosity. Um, I'm going to just now turn it over to our panel members to briefly uh, introduce themselves, uh, share their bios as it were, uh, and then we'll go through the speaking and uh, Tad will then join us. And then most of all, uh, most importantly, in a panel about democracy, uh, we look forward to your questions uh, and, uh, and answers and discussion. Uh, just a note uh, for those attending, we won't be using the chat function today, uh, but we will be using the Q&A uh, section. So if you've got a question, you can put it in there and when we get to the uh, question time, we'll make sure that we address uh, all of the questions that we can. So Jack, I'm just going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself uh, and then um, we'll go to Jennifer and then you can give us your talk. Jack. Well, thank you, Lisa. I wish I could visit you in Victoria. I've always thought it one of the most beautiful cities in the world, but we'll have to wait until this pandemic passes. Uh, my name is Jack Goldstone. I'm professor of public policy at George Mason University, just outside Washington, D.C., uh, center of all this turmoil. And I have been studying uh, revolutions, democratization, uh, democratic failure uh, for most of my academic career. I've been an advisor to a number of different government bodies. They don't usually listen to academics. I've reconciled myself to that fact. And what we really need is public discussion and public awareness to move the needle. So I'm delighted to be speaking and I look forward to answering your questions. Great, thanks very much, Jack. Jennifer, over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning. Well, we're turning into afternoon, sorry, here in, uh, in uh, Montreal. I'm Jennifer Welsh, and I'm a professor of global governance and security at McGill University. I spent a number of years uh, in Europe, uh, first at the University of Oxford and then at the European University Institute. And over my academic uh, career, I looked a lot at uh, the ethics, law, and politics of armed conflict. Uh, but I've also, uh, over the last several years, been looking at global uh, democratic trends and looking at threats to the threats to democracy uh, as a challenge for global politics and uh, global governance. So I'm very glad to be with you this afternoon. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and I am Lisa Helps. Uh, I'm the mayor of Victoria and the third panelist here. Um, I have been the mayor here in Victoria since 2014. So I'm a second, uh, halfway through my second term, um, working at the intersection of uh, climate change, systemic racism, housing insecurity, uh, all of the challenges that are facing us globally uh, are also facing us here on the ground in Canadian cities. And so when I, I get to my remarks, I'll talk about democracy at the local level and uh, the, the challenges uh, and the opportunities for, for making our democracy stronger uh, and in particular making more space for more people in our democracy. So with that little preview of who we are and what we're going to talk about, I am going to hand it back to Jack. Um, we've got about 10 to 12 minutes each, so I will time. Uh, and Jack, when you get to close to 12 minutes, uh, I will just put a note in the chat or give a little wave or do something to distract you to, to remind us to wrap up because we want to make sure we save as much time as possible to interact with the folks who are joining us. So Jack, over to you. Many thanks. Um, glad to have this opportunity to reflect on the virtues of democracy. I am a believer uh, that democracy is the best system of government for solving complex social problems. And when I say complex problems, this is something that Thomas Homer Dixon has written about quite a lot. Uh, complex problems are those where it's hard to see the whole thing at once. So you need to move incrementally, you need to be flexible, and you need to be open to feedback. So the path that you follow has to be one of self-correction 
And democracies can be particularly good at that because the feedback should come from all angles of society and the leadership should be open to have the agenda set and the issues covered uh, in response to the population. Now, that's the theory. In, in practice, uh, democracies don't always work. I mean, I think the glory days of Greece were under democracy, the glory days of Rome were under a republic, and the glory days of the Renaissance were under the republican uh, city-states of Italy. And I think the United States has had a very good run as well. Western Europe fought off fascism. So democracies are capable of some of the greatest things. The one thing they don't do well, unfortunately, is um, they're not always the best at military missions. Their authoritarian regimes can sometimes marshal resources more effectively. But the problems that we face in the world today cannot be beaten with armies. We need to face a deteriorating climate. We need to develop the inclusion of highly diverse people in a globalized society in which people all over the world are on the move. And whether it's in Europe or Japan or the United States or Canada or Australia, the reality is our societies are becoming more diverse and we have to keep that an asset and keep our societies free and open with diversity rather than put ourselves against it. And as I say, those things require a flexible incremental process. They cannot be resolved simply by putting more effort into military uh, missions. Now, I said democracy is great when it works. I think it's the best system when it works. Uh, Churchill said it takes a lot of uh, flailing around though before it does. Uh, and I don't have much time. I wanna hear from all of you. So I'll simply say, I think the biggest issue we face with making our democracies work is knowing where to find the truth. Democracy works by allowing multiple voices to express different viewpoints. And in a free and open dialogue, the truth is supposed to emerge. The best solutions are supposed to develop out of critical speech. Now, the difficulty is that can happen if you have some facts in which to ground debate, and then one can talk about um, where do we go from here. But if there are no common facts, and if the truth is simply whatever the person in power says, or whoever has the loudest megaphone, then you lose that basis for constructive dialogue and informed decision making. Now, unfortunately, social media has made it more difficult than ever to determine where the truth lies. So I think to make our democracies work, we may have to make our social media more responsible in the way that societies learn to do with other means of communication. When print developed, scurrilous pamphlets tried to undermine the truth and spread rumors. Uh, we adopted libel laws for that. Newspapers and magazines do have standards of reportage that they are required to meet. When television came, the same thing, we had to adapt. And now that we have social media, it was one thing when it was a baby um, to say, let it grow. But now that so many people get their news from social media, I think it's crucial that we say, now once again, we have a media by which people acquire news and so we have to guard the truth, make sure the truth has a foundation in the communications that reach people. Once we do that, I think we'll be back on the road to uh, being a constructive dialogue society. And then I think we can solve all our problems. I have faith in people. It's just the uh, difficulty in coming to agreement, uh, establishing mutual respect uh, when people are literally flooded uh, by a stream of lies. That's disruptive to all that we value in human interaction. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to the next speaker so that we can go forward. Great, thank you very much, Jack. We'll look forward to your reflections when we get to the Q&A. Uh, Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, you've got uh, up to 12 minutes and uh, we look forward to hearing your remarks. Great, thanks very much. Uh, what I wanted to talk a little bit about when it, uh, is about when we zoom out, what do we see happening to democracy globally? Uh, if we go back three decades ago, it felt almost as though the march of democracy seemed unstoppable. But if you look at um, organizations who study democratization, for example, Freedom House, they now demonstrate quite worryingly that democracy is in retreat. Uh, the downturn has been underway 
uh, for some time, but it's been uh, particularly steep in the past five years. Uh, last year, the number of countries around the world that experienced net declines in civil and political rights was almost double the number that registered improvements. And what's more worrying about this is that this turn is no longer concentrated among autocrac autocracies and dictatorships, but it's also infecting countries um, of, of every regime type, including those that we might traditionally have thought of as free. So countries that not long ago were praised for making democratic transitions, if we think of Hungary or the Philippines or Poland or Turkey, they are backsliding uh, into forms of illiberal and in some cases authoritarian rule. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced but also expanded the global anti-democratic trend um, as some leaders have exploited the crisis uh, to imprison journalists, for example, and opponents to crack down on protest and to heighten surveillance. Now, at the same time, if we look at some of the institutions that had as part of their design democracy clauses, so for example, the North, Amatic, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization or the European Union, they have actually been quite reluctant to criticize rollbacks of civil and political rights. And that has in many ways left authoritarianism unchecked. And if we add to this, we can see that established democracies have been absorbed by their own political challenges. Uh, I think the long-term consequences of the 2008 financial crisis have been particularly important here. I think we lose sight of the impact of that particular crisis in fostering disillusionment in a lot of Western countries in particular about what democracy can deliver. And I think what I'd like to stress here is that when I look at the work of uh, political scientists today, you'll find that while some worry about the decline in support for democratic values, uh, and we can certainly find evidence of that, that seems to be less of, a, less of the problem than rather um, a disappointment with what democracy has seemingly delivered. Um, and that's a different thing from a decline in respect um, or attraction to democratic values. And I think we need to understand that difference when we're thinking about um, the crisis of, of democracy today. I also think it's worth saying, given where we are today, that the historic role of the US as a beacon of democracy um, has been very severely tarnished uh, by a number of trends that don't just um, affect or, or become manifest in the last uh, month or so. Uh, extreme income inequality, highly polarized po uh, politics, institutional deadlock, and in some cases, worrying instances of um, executive aggrandizement, the executive branch of, of government taking excessive control. So all of these um, trends create a, a very worrying uh, landscape globally. And I just wanna end by, by asking the question, uh, about what this means for Canada specifically. What are the risks to Canada um, in this uh, environment of democratic retreat? It's clearly a priority for Canadian governments at all levels to get our own democratic house um, in order. But you might argue that the global weakening of democracy isn't necessarily a concern to Canada given our capacity to engage with countries um, that are not necessarily thriving uh, democracies. There's some, there's some who would say, we have to be pluralist in our approach. We have to deal with whatever kind of country um, confronts us. And while to a certain extent that's true, um, I want to suggest to you um, that the retreat of democracy and disunity within the West in particular leaves Canada more alone um, in the world than perhaps at any time uh, in living memory. And I just wanna end by identifying three specific risks that this global trend in democratic uh, deconsolidation poses for us. The first is the prospect of social and political instability in our key democratic allies. 
uh, and we can begin with the United States, but we can also expand um, beyond that core. Uh, we are now faced with the prospect um, that there is there are deep cleavages and, and potential for instability in some of the countries with whom we've had very close relationships, which calls upon us to ask the question of how we're gonna respond. Um, there has been a question facing every government around the world over the last two weeks, whether it acknowledges the outcome of the US election. Um, thankfully, in my view, Canada was one of the first uh, to acknowledge um, that the, Biden, that the uh, Biden team had won the election. But there is always a dilemma and a tension um, facing political leaders in other countries about how they respond to democratic development. So that's the first risk. The second is that we face a more assertive um, group, some would say block of autocratic states. Our geography and the nature of our relationship with the United States has meant that in the past, we've been protected from the prospect of conquest or occupation in Canada. But today we face concrete external threats to our values and political institutions. Even if states such as Russia don't contemplate forceful regime change in Canada, their creative use of technology, of disinformation, and their clandestine support for particular political actors are designed to weaken democratic institutions and norms. And we need to be very aware um, of that possibility and ready for that possibility. And then lastly, a risk to us is the unraveling of democratic peace and cooperation. Uh, the growing confidence of authoritarian states, I think is also driven by a sense that alternative political models might have a chance, a fighting chance, of knocking democracy off of its perch, its preeminent position. And the 1930s, I think, offer a chilling reminder that if democracy can't deliver prosperity equitably, um, if it leads to gridlock rather than decisive action, and it breeds political instability, then the appeal of rival ideologies inevitably increases. And so we are at a moment where we need to uh, shed any complacency we might have had about the inevitable uh, continuation of, of our political model. And we need to reinvest um, in strengthening it and reminding us of what, um, as our previous speaker talked about and our next speaker will no doubt talk about, what some of the foundations of a healthy uh, democracy really are. So Lisa, I'll stop there and I look very forward uh, to questions from the, the group assembled to discuss with us today. Great, Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, it's really, it's great to go last because the remarks that I uh, am going to make um, build on what both of you have said. Uh, and so it's, it's great. I, I don't know, I think um, Tad is going to have a very big challenge in wrapping up uh, the conversation here. So we might have to help him out just a little bit, maybe a few hints to him when he gets here about uh, some of the things that we've talked about. Um, so it's really a very big honor for me to be part of this panel. Uh, when I was asked, uh, I was thrilled to say yes, uh, because I spend uh, all of my time working uh, in, in democracy uh, at the local level, uh, but not a lot of time to reflect on what that means. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really delighted when I get uh, invites like this, because I get to take a, a little bit of time for reflection. Um, so. I want to frame my comments today uh, with uh, the comments that were shared with me on another panel that I was on uh, yesterday. Um, and they come from Melanie Newton. She's a professor of the history of Caribbean uh, and the Atlantic world at U of T. And we were on a, a panel together yesterday, which is going to air tomorrow, called Monumental Questions. Uh, it was about the removal of statues and changing of place names and so on. And so she said something that I think is really important. I'm going to share that with you and then illustrate some of the opportunities uh, that have come uh, and been available through local uh, democracy and the work we're doing in Victoria. So she said, and before she said this, she knew that it would be controversial, so she framed it as such, but I'm repeating it because I think it's, it's 
worth saying and, and quite true. Um, she reminded us that the that Confederation of Canada, so the, the, the Confederation of Canada, the very foundation of Canadian, Canadian democracy, was actually about the solidification of white supremacy. Uh, and of course, uh, colonial apparatus uh, that um, you know had very significant impacts on Indigenous peoples and others. So that was her premise that uh, the Canadian Confederation was about the solidification of white supremacy, and that for many, and and this follows. Uh, this is also her comment that for many. Currently, there is a space between what democracy promises and what democracy actually delivers. And Jennifer alluded to that as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is the uh, the gap between the promises of democracy and what dem democracy actually delivers at the local level, and then how we can make interventions to, to close that gap. Um, I will also reserve a little bit of time at the end. I do want to say a couple of things about social media, although Jack covered that off very well. Uh, but I, I, I can't go without making a few comments about that because I think that there are some uh, consequences to the way we're using social media and uh, also some, some opportunities. So the first uh, story that I'm going to tell uh, to illustrate the, the difference or the gap closing uh, between what democracy um, promises and what it actually delivers is actually with the um, process that we used here in the city of Victoria uh, when we removed the statue of John A. Macdonald from the front steps of City Hall uh, in the, fall, uh, the summer of 2018. It was a very, very obviously controversial uh, thing to do and it was kind of before the, the most recent wave of, of monument removals. Um, but the way that we did it, I think, uh, shows that democracy at the local level can actually be very, very flexible and can deliver and close some of those gaps. So when we uh, set out to begin our work of reconciliation uh, with the Lekwungen speaking people here in the city, uh, we went to the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations and we asked them would they be interested in participating in a task force, which is a very kind of city based and, and colonial approach. And they, you know, smiled graciously and said, well, that's that's interesting. A task force is the way that you do business. But in Lekwungen culture, the family is the unit of decision making. So they asked us, could we please create? a family, a city family. And so uh, that's what we did. Um, again, working within the confines of the municipal authority, within the community charter, uh, we created uh, a city family, which I am the head of as the mayor. It has Lekwungen members from the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, some city staff and, and some councillors. And we formed the family and the family came to gather for dinner uh, in my office once a month. And over the first few um, gatherings, it became very clear that it was very painful for the Indigenous members uh, of the family to even come to the family dinner. And that was because uh, the statue of Johnny McDonald was towering over them as they walked uh, through the front doors of City Hall. And, uh, you know, I myself, who have an undergrad degree, a master's degree, and a Three, and a half, three quarters of a PhD in Canadian history wasn't even aware until they started storytelling about the legacy that Johnny McDonald had in the creation of the residential school system. And they made it very, very clear to us that uh, if we were really serious about reconciliation, uh, that the statue needed to go. And so after they shared that with us, we spent another eight months uh, in discussion at the family over dinner, uh, talking about the pros, the cons, the implications, the challenges. And then we came to a decision as a family that it was the right thing to do and that this is what we must do. Now, I haven't mentioned city council or any motions of council or any report backs to council or anything like that, uh, because we were working in a space that democracy had created uh, through you know, our, our, our act as uh, a city embarking on reconciliation. But it was, uh, we were in a, a very uh, indigenous led, indigenous informed practice. And so we wrote a report to city council and let them know that we had decided that the statue had to be removed. And this is where uh, the conflict began um, because it was those two uh, different forces, the indigenous informed, indigenous led approach as family rather than a task force uh, pressing into the kind of colonial apparatus, if you will, of, of local government. 
But uh, to their credit, council said, yes, we agree with you. We understand that you've discussed this for the last year. We understand that this is important to the nations. And so we agree with you and the statue must be removed. And then three days later, uh, it was removed. And again, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, but the point that I want to make is that there are ways, and this was one of them, to close that gap between what uh, democracy promises, particularly to, in this case, Indigenous people, and what it actually delivers. The second and final story that I'll share, I've got more, but uh, this one is very recent uh, and still kind of um, has people's blood boiling out there in the public. Uh, and again, it's another example uh, where there, there are opportunities to stretch democracy, to recognize uh, voices and honor voices and people who have been historically marginalized by the very apparatuses that, uh, you know, democracy itself, which it's, it's supposed to uh, deliver. Um, as part of our COVID recovery here, um, recognizing that arts and culture events had been canceled, um, we created, uh, forget the name of the grant stream, but something like the Create Victoria Arts and Culture Grants. And we allocated uh, close to um, a quarter of a million dollars to arts organizations, artists, people uh, to apply to the city to do something that would um, you know, support artists and keep money flowing to them and enhance either the public space or online content creation uh, or what have you. And so there were a group of BIPOC artists who applied to the city to create a mural uh, in Bastion Square, which is one of our public squares, uh, with the words, more justice, more peace, coming out of the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that um, really was ignited uh, over the summer and with the death of, of George Floyd earlier. And so they got permission, they got money, they got paint, they, they painted the mural, uh, and then probably a few weeks uh, after it was painted, somebody noticed the uh, acronym ACAB, uh, which stands for All Cops Are Bastards, had been surreptitiously painted into the letter S of justice. And uh, obviously that became very challenging for everyone right away. Um, what, the, what the artists and their you know, young indigenous uh, people and, and people of color and, and black youth in our community, what they were saying with that acronym is that there is systemic racism in policing. That was their shorthand. Uh, but the actual uh, acronym is, is obviously offensive. Um, it's obviously very challenging, particularly for Victoria Police and, and others to see and to hear. Um, but rather than rush in with paint and paint over it, because it was on public property funded with city money, that would have you know, been the thing to do uh, if uh, you know, we weren't trying to look for um, democracy to deliver more to more people than it traditionally has. Uh, rather than rush in uh, with paint and cover it up, our city manager, who is an incredible woman and, and really took a lot of uh, leadership and, and, and also a lot of heat, uh, said, we are going to sit down with the artists and we're going to understand their point of view. And so she brought together a circle comprised of our police chief, who is South Asian, so he is a, a person of color, uh, comprised of uh, Indigenous elders facilitated by a young Indigenous woman uh, and the artists. And they sat in circle uh, for six hours one evening, and then more hours and more hours and more hours, and continued to discuss what this meant, why it's there, should it be removed, if it was going to be removed, how should it be removed, and so on and so forth. And what ended up happening uh, is that council, uh, uh, we trusted our city manager to um, to do the work that needed to be done. Uh, she informed us that there was an agreement that the uh, the acronym would be removed, uh, and and then you know council voted in in a public meeting to um, have the acronym removed and to have it replaced with something that reflected the artist's experience. We didn't know what that would be, and it wasn't our place to craft the language because, again, we were making space, as much space as possible, for these young uh, BIPOC artists. So what was agreed to uh, was that the letter S uh, should be uh, repainted, um, and, and this is what the artists wanted to cover the whole letter S with a black box with three feathers on top to uh, illustrate uh, in the... Um, 
kind of words of Bradley Dick, who's uh, from one of the nations here, the song He's Nation, uh, a, a new beginning, uh, an opportunity to move forward. Uh, and then the words, and I'll read them out to you. This letter has been censored by the city of Victoria, influenced by the Victoria Police Department. In doing so, Victoria is contributing to the silencing of Black and Indigenous voices and experiences across the land. So you can imagine that uh, the Victoria Police Department and some members of the public were equally dissatisfied with that statement, but that statement reflects the very real experiences of the artists. And so that's the statement that stands uh, on that mural to date. It was vandalized once and then repainted. And just like when we removed the statue of Johnny McDonald, we put up a plaque, the plaque was vandalized. We put a new plaque, it was vandalized. We put the plaque back and finally the plaque uh, and the words that remain there, uh, remain there. So I hope that um, those two stories really illustrate the strong possibility that democracy uh, indeed can work uh, and that at the local level uh, and arguably, I would say, at the provincial and federal and, and global level as well, um, it can also work. Uh, but it, it takes stretching um, democracy and, and being willing to use the very institutions that we have at our power, in this case, city council, to close that gap between what democracy promises uh, and what it delivers. Um, I'm at 12 minutes. I timed myself just as I did others. I don't have time to talk about social media, but I really want to. So hopefully uh, we can talk a little bit about that in the question period. And I see that Tad has arrived. So I am going to stop talking and turn it back to him. Thank you very much. You're muted. Now I'm not muted. I see I have control. I, I lost control completely for a while. Uh, just thank you very much, everyone. I, I live out in a rural area outside of Victoria. Some of you may know it's called Machosen. And uh, uh, just literally five minutes before we were to go live, uh, the power went off. We're getting one of our first big winter storms here right now. And it's, I had actually meant to warn the organizers when I saw the weather forecast that there was a likelihood of the power going off. Uh, so I switched venues. I'm now at, at uh, Royal Roads University, which is about uh, 10 kilometers away. Um, but uh, the storm is bad here too, and there's blowdown everywhere. So I may vanish into the ether again at some point. Uh, so... Uh, but it looks like everybody has started the conversation, which is great. I, I, I did plan to do a territorial acknowledgement uh, and introduce everybody with bio, bios. Uh, I think that's probably a bit academic at the moment. Um, and I so wish I'd heard, so wish I'd heard the, uh, uh, the comments by uh, Jennifer and Jack, who are dear friends and colleagues of mine, and all, all of us are enormously concerned about the prospects for democracy. Um, but I did hear much of uh, Mayor Help's uh, comments and uh, that was uh, enormously interesting and it's exactly what I was hoping <clears throat> Mayor Helps would talk about uh, and because there have been these the sort of microcosm issues within Victoria that I think are reflecting many of the stresses that we're experiencing uh, more generally in the world. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, Lisa, I'm not sure which was the first story you told, but I don't know whether it was bike lanes or... or uh, it was about the removal of the John A. Macdonald statue. Right. So there are two more things then. You mentioned social media, and I think we should talk about social media, but also the bike lanes issue is very interesting because it, it, it's, it's at this intersection of, of uh, urban renewal uh, and climate change and energy, energy transition uh, and it really, um, it, it really evokes, obviously, deep ideological commitments from various communities. And I know it's been an, a, a big initiative for you in Victoria and also enormously controversial. So maybe that's something we could talk about briefly. Um, just a, a couple of comments, because, again, I haven't heard what Jack or, or Jennifer has said, but uh, uh, just a, a few remarks then on why I wanted to have this conversation and some of this may be redundant given what's already been said, but um, uh, I regard uh, government and governance structures as in significant part problem solving mechanisms. 
Uh, and now they're not, it's not entirely about problem solving, but if, if government, whatever government institutions you have don't solve major problems, then they they, they lose one of the principal elements of their legitimacy of their moral authority. And, uh, when you look around the world today, uh, you, there are some real questions about whether democracy, and I think there's difference between democratic practices, perhaps the local level, such as we're experiencing Victoria and, and democracy as it's exhibited at the, at the uh, regional or state or provincial or national level. There's scale issues there that are important. But certainly at the, at the more macro levels, the larger scales, we seem to be seeing uh, extraordinary failures in problem solving within democracies. And the pandemic is, is exhibit A, uh, it's extraordinarily striking that, uh, and we don't aren't talking about this anymore. But after being the source of the of the uh, of the virus, the uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, China not only uh, got it under control, but has essentially eliminated it within its borders, and its economy is now growing again at six to seven percent a year, uh, and and it's been able to stay on top of that. Of, of the infections and control those infections through what we would regard in the West as extraordinarily draconian and authoritarian measures. Uh, meanwhile, in, uh, in many Western countries, not all, but many Western countries, things are decidedly out of control, uh, most particularly in the United States, but also in Europe. You, you could explain the American situation in part because of the sui generis or unique uh, 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 dysfunction associated with the Trump administration. Jack, I'm trying to put that politely. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Jack has already talked about this, but, you know, uh, European social democracies uh, have, in some sense, more robust democratic institutions, and they also are failing to control this. On the other hand, there are some democracies, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, Japan, where the story is really very different. So one has to wonder what are all the factors in the mix here? So the pandemic is a very interesting story about problem solving and democracies more generally, Western style democracies don't seem to be, so don't seem to be uh, performing, uh, getting high grades for the most part, certainly not across the board. Um, then, but then you look at another challenge that we're facing climate change, which is something I'm particularly concerned about. And, uh, and all governance structures and governance, form, governance forms in the world are failing uh, to get ahead of this problem and manage it. Um, and, and in partly because it's a collective action problem at the global level and everybody seems to have, needs to have to work together, our weak global institutions are a major source of our failure to solve the climate change problem. But even within individual actors, uh, we're seeing nowhere near and including democracies, but also non-democracies, we're seeing nowhere near the movement that we need to see to reduce carbon emissions, not, not even a, a small fraction of where we need to be. Um, uh, and the situation, the climate situation is, even though it's been pushed to the back burner for the last little while, is now demonstrably critical. It, the, the, the Arctic has seen some of the worst worst ice loss in 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 uh, recorded history just in this past few months, uh, with consequences potentially potentially for the climate over the entire northern hemisphere of the planet. Uh, the last fire season was not only bad, unbelievably bad in North America for those of us on the west coast experiencing the fires and, and smoke, but there were tens of thousands of fires in the boreal forest in Siberia, the worst fire season in in recorded history in Siberia. Uh, that it's, it, it appears to be the case that the Arctic has now become a net contributor to carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, which means that there's a positive self-reinforcing feedback that's developed in the Arctic. Uh, uh, so, so if not democracy, and if not a more authoritarian regimes, what do we need to address this challenge uh, within our nations and also globally? So those are the things that were on my mind when I uh, suggested this topic. And uh, I have my own uh, explanations and arguments for why we are in this situation, specifically focusing on democracy, uh, modern Western democracy. Uh, I, I think the, the differences that we're seeing between the, 
the functionality of democracy frequently, the reasonable functionality at the local and regional levels and the dysfunction at the national levels are really striking. And maybe that's an issue that we could, we could explore a little bit. Uh, um, but I, I think with, uh, with those remarks, since I don't actually know what anybody else has said except the last half of Lisa's comments, I think I should probably zip up and maybe we can open up the conversation between the four of us. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think, I think we're all gonna be unmuted by the manager at this point and we can chat. And, and I'm going to have, being sort of a quasi chair now, I'm gonna use a very light hand <laughs> since I have no idea what's going on. Hello, Jennifer, hello, Jack. <laughs> and uh, it's really delightful to see you. I, I, I should say just the one last thing is that, you know, Jennifer, Jack and I have known each other for decades and have worked together in various contexts. I have enormous respect for both of them, I'm delighted that they're here and I'm fascinated to hear what they have to say. So, and Lisa, it's so wonderful that you could join us uh, uh, given your extraordinary expertise and the function, the fine grained functionality of democracy at the local level. So uh, this is a really a great group. So. Let's chat for a few minutes. We're supposed to end in 45. And uh, I think maybe we can have 10 or 15 minutes of conversation before we get into the Q&A. OK. Jack. Thank you. And uh, certainly kudos to you, Ted, for bringing us together. And let me express our uh, deep respect for the great diversity of work you've done. I highlighted your concern about complex problems before you arrived. Um, but I also want to get back to something that um, Lisa said, because I think it's equally important. Societies do not do well at problem solving, even if they have the facts and the technical expertise and the means to do so, unless they have a sense of community. You need a community to simply get people to do what the government tells them to do. One of the reasons that Taiwan and Australia and New Zealand were successful is people have somewhat greater trust of government there, same in Canada, compared to countries like France or Spain, Italy, or the United States, where people tend to distrust the government and want it out of their lives. Uh, and that's, that's a difficult, uh, particularly bad for public health, but it's a difficult environment for, for problem solving in general. Now you can build a sense of community on the basis of uh, simple identities or on the basis of functionality. And I think the problem we're having with our democracies in the West, Jennifer talked about the deterioration that we've had, is that functionality has been difficult to achieve. That is getting everybody to kind of agree on the same page that we're one community if we work together. Uh, and democracy is not just voting. Democracy needs to be built on having a democratic society. That means democratic regard for the dignity of every individual, democratic policing that defends people under the law rather than just defends the wealthy and the powerful from others. It's a whole different concept. You know, do, do you treat society as having uh, values from the bottom up or the top down? And the type of police abuses that we saw that triggered uh, enormous protests this summer should not occur in a society in which every human life has dignity and value. And the type of um, implicit threat in the United States, we had our symbolic issues too with Confederate flags and Confederate statues. If you want a community to be a functional democracy, every individual has to feel respected. And if you happen to have monuments around from an earlier time when parts of the society were singled out and mistreated, you can't maintain that functional unity. So the symbolic atmosphere needs to evolve with the community, with the guideline being everyone's entitled to dignity and respect. But we've lost a lot of that. The world has changed so rapidly. Uh, technology has changed, jobs have changed, the uh, composition of our societies have changed, who we talk to, uh, where we draw our income, all of this has become more scattered and quickly changing and has led to a lot of anxiety. We got infatuated with the meritocracy to where we allowed the meritocracy to create enormous inequality and disparities that are also not consistent with the functioning of a democratic society. So in a sense, we need to solve these existential problems of climate change and coping with diversity 
But I think restoring democracy by avoiding it being hollowed out, you need a strong middle class, you need dignity for citizens, you need people to trust each other, to be able to talk to each other, to trust the government, uh, before we can get these solutions taken care of. I mean, we're struggling with this huge pandemic. And th maybe the saddest part is that we're now at about 1,500 deaths a day in the United States. And instead of people saying, this is intolerable, this is a, a tragedy, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's the new normal, people will die. It, it, you know, maybe it, it won't be people I know because most of the people who are dying are different. They, different races, different conditions, different places. Um, and that's precisely what has, has allowed the disease, ironically, to spread everywhere, to everyone. So the people who had that attitude are now being most impacted. Uh, just another way of saying democracy and problem solving don't work if we're not all in it together and if we don't create conditions in which everyone feels they're valued. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Yeah, there's a, I, I really think this issue of, um, of not focusing only on whether you procedurally have voice, whether you can express your, your voice in a democracy, but whether your voice is actually heard and internalized is really at the crux of, of uh, this notion that democracy doesn't deliver. But I just wanted to come back to the to this question of, of why certain levels might seem to be performing better, right? So why a local level um, setting might be more conducive to democracy than higher levels, especially if you want to go to the global level. And it's tempting to rush to the conclusion, well, that smaller level is more conducive because you have more homogeneity, right? Uh, but as Jack said, um, that's not our reality. You know, our reality in a modern world is that we don't actually have that homogeneity and we won't have that homogeneity if we look at migration trends. So it actually is, and it, I believe it is based and has to be based on something else. We have lots of myths that tell us, yes, it is about homogeneity. And, and so when I think about when democracies are functioning better or worse, because I think it is on a spectrum today, whether than well, well or bad, right? None of them are, are uh, knocking it out of the park as, as you were. One of them is this notion that in some democracies, there's still a sense that risk is collectivized, right? We're sharing risk. This idea that in COVID, I am willing to do so certain things in order to mitigate risks against someone else. And I think the Canadian system, it comes to political culture almost, the Canadian system, and particularly our version of the welfare state was very much based on this idea that we're, col we're collectivizing a sense of risk. But the other value that I've increasingly come to think is essential to democracy, and maybe we've all been saying it, are perceptions of fairness. That fairness is the word I keep coming back to. And I think I'm somewhat guilty of being um, very attracted to the idea that income inequality is the driving uh, factor in dissatisfaction with democracy. And I, I probably shouldn't emphasize it as much as I do, um, but it's linked to fairness. And I come back to that famous, um, I talked about this, Tad, in, in my, one of my Massey lectures, that famous experiment by the Dutch scientist with the two monkeys and, and the grape that he gives to one for uh, his behavior and the rock he gives to another for the same behavior. And, you know, eventually the monkey who's getting the rock starts to rattle his cage and, and say, you know, I'm doing the same thing as the monkey in cage B, but why aren't I getting a grape? You know, and it's, it's this sense that fairness, and I do think that that's what's happened in the United States, but elsewhere, it is this sense of a lack of fairness, even more so than the procedures of democracy, which we've been so concerned with protecting, um, that is part of the malaise 
uh, that we are in. Now, Lisa, you talked about fairness in the deepest structural sense, right? That, you know, our very institutions at their origins were based on profound unfairness. But I, I think it continues in, in different ways. And, and, and I think this is some of what Jack was, was also alluding to in his, in his comments. Lisa, did you want to add anything to this? A couple yeah. of comments. I, I, I'll come in with a perspective from complexity theory in a moment, but uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, just to the last point that Jennifer made, um, I began, um, Tad, by quoting Melanie Newton, who's a history professor at U of T who studies um, Caribbean and uh, Atlantic history. And I was uh, coincidentally on a panel with her yesterday, and she reminded all of us uh, that Confederation, Canadian Confederation was an attempt to shore up rights, white supremacy, that that was the very nature of the of Canadian democracy was to do that. And then she, she talked about, which I also shared at the beginning to frame my remarks, the difference, and, and Jennifer talked about this as well, the difference between what democracy promises and, and what it actually delivers. And I, I think that it's it is a really important conversation to be able to have um, on on two levels one is unpacking the institutions themselves you know, like having those really difficult conversations about Canadian Confederation as an, an attempt to shore up white supremacy while still embracing those as the ways that we govern while at the same time on another level being able to to talk about you know democratic inclusion on an everyday basis that doesn't have to do with voting that doesn't have to do with going to your city council or you're writing your mla or, or all of the other ways like the kind of um the, the the life at the fringes of democratic institutions and and those also need you know conversations about systemic racism are, are we, we can't ignore we that i think we're, we're really at an inflection point and, and i think it's exciting um and i won't say any more than that but i, I really do want want to talk uh, later about what Jack was saying about the, the inability to have those fundamental conversations that, that, that the social media kind of that's, that's poisoning some of the spaces both inside the, the de democratic institutions and, and in civil society. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I know you've been on the uh, receiving end of in incredible vitriol with, from social media. And, it, it, you know, it, if we can carve out five minutes for you to talk a little bit about that, I think that would be very useful. Um, just listening to the conversation I've heard so far, you know, Jack mentioned that I'm a complex systems person. And complex systems people are always looking for pos what are called positive feedback loops. Those aren't necessarily good feedback loops. They are self-reinforcing feedback loops, where a change in the system produces a series of other changes that reinforces the original change. And positive feedback loops tend to be destabilizing. They tend to shift systems from one place to another, from one equilibrium to another. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. Sometimes they can shift you from a bad place to a good place. But I mean, what I'm hearing and what I think we all recognize as scholars of this, of this uh, challenge, either lay or, or academic scholars, is uh, you know, that, that we have a problem with functionality, as Jack was saying which includes, I think, uh, uh, not just a perception, but a real absence of fairness, not just a perception of the absence of fairness, but real problems with fairness. Uh, and the kind of, and in, in many societies now, rather than a collectivization of risk, a disaggregation of risks, the risk is un unfairly borne by different components. Uh, and and that, that decline in functionality is leading to a decline in faith in government. And the decline in faith in government is leading people to retreat into their identity groups to try to protect themselves, uh, uh, they, you know, to build barriers, to build walls, to build gates, uh, to arm themselves in the worst case, as we see in the United States. And all of that just further erodes the functionality of government. So this is a very, very powerful feedback loop that has developed in many of these societies. And in many cases, you know, the worse the problems get, as Jack was suggesting, the worse the problems get, uh, the more justification you have for giving up on government, whether it's, whether it's climate or, or the pandemic or what have you. And one thing I've noticed quite interesting in the world is that we've seen a real divergence between, uh, between the, so far the polling data in, in uh, the United States and in many other countries. In most countries, according to international polling data from Pew and others, uh, there's been a 
it, it, the it, people have come together. There's been a reinforcement of a sense of common solidarity within societies around the pandemic problem, at least so far. I don't know if that's changing now, just in the last few weeks with the second surge. But in the United States, it produced exactly the opposite. It produced a divergence, a, a rejection of the, uh, a, a broader rejection of the role of government in solving this problem, a kind of throwing up your hands and saying, okay, I guess we just have to live with it, you know, as, as, as exemplified by the Great Barrington Declaration on, uh, on the COVID crisis, which basically said, let it rip. And we can try to protect the older people and vulnerable ones, but, you know, we're just going to have to try to go, to go for herd immunity, which will cause millions of people to die. So, so this is, so, you know, I, and Lisa, I see, I see the, the, the social media as being a very important facilitator of this feedback loop because it, it, it helps reinforce these identity divisions. And it's, it's contributing to what I would call the epistemic fragmentation of our societies where people live in their own kind of knowledge bubbles. And we don't have a shared sense of reality in many cases of basic facts of the matter, whether it's the pandemic, whether coronavirus exists, whether it's climate change. And to the extent we can't share basic facts about our reality, it's really hard to have, to have a democratic agora in which we have a conversation about, uh, about the, how we're going to address these challenges we face. And I, I don't have a clear solution to this mess that we've gotten ourselves into, but these, this, this feedback loop is ex extraordinarily powerful now and really debilitating and could really set up the circumstances. I think Jack and I have talked about this for a, a kind of wholesale shift, shift towards more authoritarian regimes in the world. Uh, so uh, um, we, are, we, we should switch to questions in a moment, but Lisa, do you want to say just a little bit about your experience with social media? Because I know it's really affected you deeply and it's been difficult. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it actually doesn't affect me deeply. I, I, it affects our democracy and our ability to have dialogue way more than it affects me. Like, I don't feel... Well, it affects me deeply watching what's happening to you. <laughs> well, that's so kind. <laughs> well, and, and I, I, I'd love to hear Jack's take on this as well, because he, he talked a little bit about it in his remarks. But I think the day... So first of all, I am off Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So I am, I am social media free, and I think it's making me a better mayor and a better person. So that's, you know, that's just a, a declaration. But no, the biggest worry that I have is, is something that Jack shared in his remarks. And, and I, I don't think that social media is causing the erosion of our democracy. I think that gives it way too much power. But what it is doing is impeding our ability, maybe as Jack and you both said, to agree on a basic set of facts, but also it's impeding our ability to change our minds. It's yeah. our, it, and that is that democracy and deliberative dialogue is fundamentally premised on the ability to change our minds, to get new information, to hear new ideas, not to change our values, not to, but, but to, to change our minds. And, and there is no room for that. There's little room for that on social media because it feeds that kind of polarization. So my worry is that, you know, we're going to become, you know, our, our neural pathways as, as, a, as a collective are going to be uh, rooted in this inability to have you know, Foucault calls it ethical listening, to listen to somebody, to be impacted by what is said to us, and then by changing our minds and taking a little bit of a different path. And, you know, if we can't do that, we're not going to address inequality, we're not going to address climate change. So that that's my big worry about social media is that it's, it's impeding our ability to have uh, authentic, deliberative dialogue, which is the only thing that's going to actually help us save ourselves is that ability to, to talk with each other in, in an authentic and an ethical way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it, it, before we turn to questions, Jack and Jennifer, any, any uh, quick comments on what we've just been discussing? I do think we have to think of, uh, you know, get used to thinking of consequences of what we do. The social media world is one of immediate feedback. And it's one that destroys civility of space. If I have a conversation with Lisa face to face, we can air our differences and try different perspectives. If we have that conversation in social media with thousands or more people watching and yelling at us, if we deviate from their viewpoint, it's much harder to have a conversation. And as you say, the default is to simply retreat, uh, retreat to emphasizing that which gives us the most feedback from the social media audience. And that may not be what takes us to mutual understanding. So I, I think it's terrible. What I tell people about Facebook is, let's take a computer program designed to give young men a forum for making 
objectifying and misogynistic comments on women, and let's turn that into the model for global dialogue, right? What could go wrong? But that's where we are. I so, think, I, go, I sorry, Jennifer, go also, ahead. Um, I mean, you use the word epistemic, Tad. I think what it also enables um, is this uh, capacity that uh, President Trump has to sow doubt. Uh, you sow doubt that then disperses on social media. And you don't actually um, have to do very much. It has a life of its own. Yeah. And where I saw this have an interesting uh, effect was actually at the global level where you require, because there you, you really do have societies with different value systems and political systems that have to come together to agree on collective action. And what this capacity to sow doubt on the facts does is it focuses everyone's attention on what's real or what isn't, as opposed to you know, the, the resources and will you need to mobilize to act. And I saw this just to, to give you a little example before we move on, there was a debate in the UN Security Council in 2014 about whether to refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. And it was never going to result in a resolution in favor of doing that because it was going to be vetoed. So everyone knew that, uh, but nonetheless, the French government in particular wanted to have the debate to try to tease out, well, what would be the alternative if we weren't going to take this step? But the debate was completely fixated on whether the video uh, imagery and social media evidence that the French government was putting on the table for atrocities was real. Uh, and that's where the where the Russian government was, you know, fixated. And, it, and we never got to the substance of the debate. So, you know, if you th if you think it's hard at a national level, take it to the international level. How do you create an authoritative understanding of a situation that will facilitate collective action? Uh, so this capacity to sow doubt and then have that doubt just disperse. Uh, in a way, Tad, I know you talk about this a lot, you know, how things disperse in very um, unlinear, <laughs> unlinear ways, I think is really, really destructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing I've been thinking about in that regard just over the last little while is, is that people within these epistemic bubbles, these knowledge bubbles that they create for themselves, develop essentially what Karl Popper would call non-falsifiable theories of the world. Uh, which be, basically means there's absolutely no evidence that can be provided that will, that will convince them that they're wrong. And I think we're seeing this in real time in the United States right now among tens of millions of people who believe that the election has been falsified. There is absolutely no way you can convince them otherwise. It doesn't matter what evidence you provide. The, the, the background theory of the essential uh, perniciousness of uh, liberal Democrats and woke liberal de Democrats is so so uh, so powerful that it just gets m modified to accommodate any anomalous evidence, anything. And it's gonna get worse, Jennifer, as soon as we, we have really good fake videos out there. Uh, that, the, the, you know, that, it, 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 the interesting thing is that it can actually force us to retreat to uh, interpersonal conversations as sources of truth because we won't be able to trust anything that we're, we're getting online at a certain point when the AI gets, the artificial intelligence gets good enough to create essentially entirely artificial realities that look exactly like real reality. So that's a, that, this, this fragmentation of what we understand by reality is, and, and the common set of facts, you can't run a democracy without that, that, uh, some agreement on a common, common set of facts about what the nature of our situation is. Uh, now, in looking at the questions, um, uh, uh, there are a lot of really good ones, but here's one that Lars has, has suggested, and I think it, 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 it sort of crystallizes much of what we've been discussing. He says, with regards to collective action in a democratic state, what are the key components, or I could say, what are the ways that we could meaningfully bridge the rural-urban divide? And uh, you know, 
Jack, this recent election in the United States, uh, it, there's such a strong correlation between uh, the Trump supporters and the Biden supporters and the, uh, and the rural urban populations. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that. And we're seeing it, of course, all over the world. We see it in BC and, and in Quebec and everywhere. So I think it's a question that we've all been puzzling over. And, and, and what can we do to try to uh, bring these communities together more meaningfully? Yeah, um, there's a straightforward economic dimension to it. And then there's a community dimension to it. The economic part is that the urban areas have been doing much better economically out of globaliz globalization and technological progress. So the big metro centers, you know, not just uh, Seattle, Vancouver, Toronto, New York, but also uh, Atlanta, Boulder, Austin, uh, Portland, um, any place where you have a communication center, creative people, which usually also means a diversity of people with diverse identities, diverse gender roles, a lot of fluidity and social interaction, they're better at processing information and new ideas. And in the idea economy, they get disproportionately rewarded. So those places have generally been doing well. In the United States, the majority of economic growth has come out of the top 25 uh, metropolitan areas. The small town and rural areas, uh, farming, ranching, older manufacturing, um, those are all limited in their ability to drive rapid economic growth. And the result of that also has been a lot of out-migration. Young people move out of rural and small town areas. They're losing population. Um, so there's a definite sense in which you talk about fairness, Jennifer, these are hardworking people who have invested their whole lives in their farms, in their ranches, in their factories, in their local shops. And yet the economy falters. If there's a bad farm year, it's not only bad for the farmers, it's bad for all the suppliers, the banks, the restaurants, everything in those local communities. And there's not like there's a lot of turnover and a lot of people seeking to move in. So as those rural communities gradually fall behind, everyone is, is hurt. And the sense of fairness would require that society make a disproportionate investment to ensure that those people have opportunities, whether it's a question of scholarships for their kids to give them on track or subsidies to help them sell their homes if they wanna move. Uh, but we don't do that. The closest thing we've been doing is giving subsidies to farmers to deal with the effects of fluctuations in the market. But that really just deals with fluctuations. It doesn't give them a, a different life trajectory. Um, so how do we overcome that difference? Because the difference has been rural small town voters voting for a traditional identity, hoping to restore a way of life, voting out of anger and hatred at what they consider urban cosmopolitan elites, and voting for an authoritarian leader going back to Tocqueville who said, if you have a lot of inequality and unfairness in the population, those who are losing will vote for equality, but it will be the equality that everybody shares underneath a single authoritarian ruler. And that's more fair in a lot of people's eyes than what they're getting from the current system. So the, the way I think to start to overcome this first is you need national service. You simply need people from different parts of society to be physically brought together, to work together for common goals, even if it's only for a couple of years, to realize you know, it, Democrats don't want to destroy America. It's not like people in small towns are for freedom and people in the cities are against it. Uh, those simplifications can only be overcome, I think, with a lot of personal contact and getting really kind of getting acquainted and doing things. So I think national service will help. Uh, and then you also need national parties that try and bridge those differences rather than identify with them. But unfortunately, as Tad knows very well, we're kind of uh, reinforcing identities in this kind of uh, positive feedback loop where people who feel they're losing out pull away from society to reinforce their group rather than reach out. Now, I do hope the Biden presidency, here's someone who's been around for 50 years. He's worked with different kind of communities. He's earned the respect of different communities. Maybe he can create a change in direction and put us on a different feedback loop in the United States, which I think would help democracy everywhere. But it's gonna be a tough struggle. It remains to be seen because the life experiences for decades 
in these different communities. Same thing is Little Britain and London. Uh, same thing is true in a lot of other areas. Uh, it's going to take really conscious effort to overcome on the basis of we have to be one community. It's not going to be overcome if people simply say, well, everybody's on their own to achieve their own success and devil take the hindmost. Lisa or Jennifer, do you want to add anything to these comments? I mean, it's a global problem, right? We can see this, this rural urban divide pretty well everywhere. I mean, even, even in, in, in authoritarian societies such as China, it's been something they've been struggling with for a long time. Although I don't think, it, I don't think there's quite the kind of ideological dynamic there that you see here, Lisa? Sure. I mean, I just, I feel my example seems so small, but I guess that's why you've brought me here. Um, in terms of the question about bridging the rural urban divide here on Vancouver Island, we've created a, an entity or an initiative called the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative. And it's uh, run by local governments for local governments to um, uh, amend the way we spend money to benefit our local economies more. So whether that's hiring uh, Indigenous youth or marginalized people are requiring that if we're getting a contractor to build our swimming pool, that there's some kind of community benefit. And rather than Victoria doing it alone and Nanaimo doing it alone, which are some of the bigger areas, it's it's a it's it, there. The, towns as small as a thousand member a thousand residents are also part of this initiative and so I, you know i don't need to go on and on about the initiative itself it's it's brilliant we've already kind of reallocated 25 million dollars of spending to benefit our local economies but the the point is you know this is just one example one way to bridge the rural urban divide is to find areas of common interest and set to work together on them and that's what the ccspi the coastal community social procurement initiative is doing rural and urban together different scales different challenges but same uh, goal which is to use local procurement use municipal procurement to strengthen our local economies whether they're uh, you know population 150,000 or population 600. Interesting. And one of the things that that uh, we are seeing I think with this current pandemic crisis is a, a, a weakening of the forces of globalization and maybe even the beginning of a, a de-globalization process and certainly uh, people like President Trump have been advocating that uh, if, because of their particular ideological, populist, nationalist ideological agendas. Um, but uh, uh, I think many, many people, even on the progressive left, would acknowledge that that uh, uh, globalization processes have contributed to a lot of the forces you were identifying, Jack. Uh, the the uh, decline of manufacturing, the decline of uh, industries in rural areas, the depopulation of rural areas, the chronic economic crisis of farmers in a globally competitive agricultural market. So it, it, one of the things that may happen is, is evolving out of the pandemic, and certainly it's potentially also a consequence of the energy transition we're going through, is a return to more local or regional production. Uh, a greater a greater amount of uh, economic independence at the regional and local levels, which frankly I've been advocating for a long time because it's a key element of anything that any any kind of resilient uh, community and resilient society is the capacity to at least produce a large, a reasonably large fraction of the things you essentially need for survival, uh, whether it's food or water or uh, medical supplies or personal protective equipment or whatever, the things that we found that we, we now rely upon the other side of the planet for. In, in the climate change situation, we may well be looking at circumstances in the future where we have simultaneous failures of major breadbaskets in the world. It's going to really help if there's greater capacity to produce food at the regional and local level that is already designed to be somewhat resilient to climate change. Uh, so so uh, that, I, it strikes me that that kind of relocalization and re-regionalization would help, might help um, uh, compensate a bit or, or, or mitigate this widening economic gap between rural and urban areas. Because a, a lot of that production and a lot of that wealth generation for, can, can return to ur rural areas potentially. Um, it's material stuff we need. And material stuff is produced in rural areas for the most part, as opposed to ideas which are produced in urban areas. Jennifer, did you want to say anything about this? I just wanted to come back to this um, issue that Jack raised 
uh, about, you know, what are the concrete programs we could put in place to, to counteract some of the tendencies we're, we're seeing. And I also saw it in one of the questions uh, being asked about, you know, do we, do we regulate, do we legislate uh, our way out of this problem, right? Do we, how do we create the programs and pieces of legislation that will help uh, get at some of the issues in democracy? And so as we were talking, I was thinking, well, there is the domain of, of social media, and that's very much in our minds right now, you know, whether there will be the courage um, and conviction to take steps to, you know, ask them to do uh, particular things. But, you know, I also think about those countries like Australia, I believe this is still the case, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where it's compulsory to vote, right? You have their, their solution to apathy was let's make it compulsory to vote. It would never and, work in the U.S. Well, it would never work in the U.S., but I'm thinking about what's the equivalent in some of the areas we've been talking about. Now, don't, don't quote me on this because I'm literally brainstorming, right? Um, but it's, you know, how do we, is there a way of requiring people at some stage, either through national service, but also with respect to information? Is it literally impossible to ensure that people see common information sources like that sounds so draconian right what you read should be completely your free choice but you know i think about the generation in britain right that uh if you are um, an insomniac you would always go to sleep listening to that little broadcast just a, a before or after the midnight news the shipping forecast with that person's voice that would put you off to sleep but it meant that hundreds of thousands of people were listening to the same radio broadcast, the same news in Britain. And I wonder if there's an equivalent of this we need to think about that isn't draconian. That is a, whether, you know, part of what we do is we do it in schools. But I think the point that we're seeing now is that throughout your life, that's also what matters. You know, citizenship education doesn't stop in school. <laughs> it, it continues. So, there may be a limit to the degree we, we can think of, of legislation and regulation as our way to attack some of these things. But I think given the nature of the challenges, we have to be really creative. <laughs> Absolutely. Lisa? Well, this is, this is riffing and brainstorming even more, which is why these kinds of conversations are thrilling. But what if it was something like requiring people to renew their citizenship every seven years or something. And I, I don't mean literally, but you know, when, when people, and I've been to a whole bunch of citizenship ceremonies as mayor and they're so moving. They're all of these people who've come to Canada and they've been through the citizenship course. They get that common understanding and, and it, it evolves and it changes as, as you know, the, the actual uh, course material catches up with the reality, but what something like that, where there's this, you know, whether it's when you file your, I don't know, but some kind of thing that gives us as, as people living in Canada, uh, a, a common um, opportunity to, to get that shared information, whether it's the radio, as, as Jennifer suggests, but the, the citizenship thing just occurred to me because it's, it's a something that's already delivered. So maybe there's a way of picking up on that. And even if it's voluntary, you know, renew your citizenship and take the course again, you have to renew your driver's license once in a while. So maybe it's the same thing, making sure we still know the rules of the road for Canadian democracy. So it's the social or the societal equivalent of renewing your vows in a marriage. I, yeah. like, that idea. No, I, I like that too. I, th I think in the U.S., if you required people every five years when they renew their driver's license to take a you know, two hour class, one hour driving and one hour being a good citizen, yeah, people might you know, go that far. Because with immigration, people are always saying, oh, people don't know, uh, they don't know enough about their country. Well, okay, let, let's put, <laughs> put something behind that. It might, it might work. Yeah, Jack, just we have one more other question that seems to be um, that I think would be really interesting to address here. But quickly, you know, there is the repeal of the fairness doctrine in the United States, which yeah. had a huge impact on on public discourse. Uh, I think that was under Ronald Reagan or something. And there was a requirement at one point for major public broadcasters to actually represent all points of view, all, you know, quote, quote, unquote, reasonable points of view. Do you do you think that, th that it would be reasonable to go back to that kind of stipulation? I don't think that's really a solution. Um, we have debate shows and so on. Uh, people can find different perspectives. I think it's more important to have a kind of liability regime again, where 
uh, people are prevented from, tell, from, from knowingly giving dangerous misinformation on public airwaves and social media. I think we've kind of let people, oh, it's all opinion. People can say whatever they want. There's no harm in that. And that's no longer true. I think we need to be a little bit more careful about who's yelling fire in a crowded theater. Yeah. I do think, you know, the late night show, I, we had public service announcements when I was growing up for, you know, don't smoke, uh, put on seat belts uh, in the Cold War. It was, if you hear a, a air raid siren dive under your desk, wouldn't have done you any good. All right. But just knowing that everybody was getting the same announcements was useful. And I think having public service announcements, you know, that are tailored uh, telling people on the East and Gulf Coast that, you know, this uh, hurricane frequencies have been going up, intensities have been going up due to climate change. Hurricanes are now intensifying in strength much more rapidly than ever before, so that a relatively harmless category one storm can become a category four overnight. And that this will be much more dangerous in the future if we don't start reducing that heat energy that's stored in the oceans that feeds these storms. That's a public service announcement, and it will resonate with the experience of people. In the Midwest, you give pictures of floods. I mean, you know, the United States really got socked with climate change the last few years. The Mississippi Valley was underwater, the West Coast was on fire and the East Coast was getting blown down all the way from uh, New York to Louisiana. But no one is putting the message out before the public in a kind of repeated and informing and even entertaining way. So we now have quite a few questions coming in and with great regret, we're not going to be able to address them all. But uh, uh, I just, there does seem to be a, a developing consensus across some of the questions, and, and I think well put by uh, Rene Letelier here, uh, who asks, it's not just social media that impedes democracy, it's also media empires such as Rupert Murdoch's mm. uh, that have influenced the UK, Australia and the US, Fox News. Um, so this is the issue of sort of capitalist concentration of power, uh, vested interests arise, that arise from that and how they can uh, torque uh, democratic debate and uh, democratic governance, how can we mitigate this threat to media diversity and democracy? So, I mean, that really cuts to the core, I think, in many of the questions that we're trying to address here. And several people have raised the same, the same question so, uh, in, in various guises. So uh, we can talk about um, concentrations of economic power more generally and, and their impacts, but specifically uh, Rupert Mark Murdoch's empire and Fox News, I think that it's pretty good exhibit A of the challenge that we might face. Well, Jennifer's dealt with the BBC and she's dealt with European broadcasts uh, and now she's in Canada. I'd like to hear her perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I do think that public broadcasters are incredibly important uh, and that they have to uh, you know, they, they obviously have to uh, perform and they have to be accountable. Uh, but I do think that they are an incredibly important also source of, um, I don't want to say national identity in the strong sense, uh, but commonality. Uh, and I think the degree to which, you know, they have been pressured by the effects of this, con this concentration um, you know, needs to be needs to be addressed. But again, it comes down to the point of how do you communicate and convince a population that that is, um, you know, worth their continued investment? I mean, the licensing fee in the UK uh, that everyone pays, it is something that you pause and you think about. And of course, a lot of individual citizens um, are not always happy. Uh, about that licensing fee, but I think it needs to be, it needs to be a bipartisan or in, if you're in the U.S. or multi-partisan uh, consensus that you build, you know, bedrock support for that. Um, with respect to the media concentration, if you look at who's come out of COVID wealthy, and you look at in part who came out of the 2008 financial crisis healthy a lot of big media companies uh, are at the top of that list. And also given, and some of you will know um, more about this as we really um, extend to think about um, 
new technology and digital platforms. We also have the problem that, you know, they have really placed stress on our tax regimes and our actual ability to tax uh, value and profit from them. And I, you know, I think the sooner we are bold enough to take some of these steps uh, to either try to prevent concentration or to think through how we're going to tax the value that's generated, the sooner we are bolder, the better, uh, because they are key sources of the problem we face. Jack and Lisa, do you want to comment on this issue? Well, we've been given the authorization to go teeny bit over time. So I hope uh, that's okay for the three of you. Uh, and and, and uh, I just, you know, I want to talk about bike lanes. <laughs> because I was in Montreal uh, at the, in, early in the year and uh, uh, not looking both ways. I was just about hit by a bike going, you know, the other way on a one-way traffic street and in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a, uh, a protected bike lane. And then I started to look around and they're all over Montreal. And I haven't heard that this was a source of enormous controversy in Montreal. And yet in Victoria, it's been, it's just filled up the airways and filled up the the newspaper with letters and and it's been very contentious uh so you know it seems to be kind of a uh, a microcosm i'm wondering i'm wondering what the difference is and was in montreal jennifer i don't know if you've been there in your recent sojourn in montreal long enough to say i also noticed interestingly enough that during the big climate strike demonstrations last september uh, i think montreal had the biggest in north america like a third of a million or close to half a million people turned out. Now, it was partly influenced by the fact that Greta Thunberg happened to be in Montreal. But uh, there is a, there are obviously some cultural differences with respect to some of these issues. And uh, I, th I think the contrast between, between what we're experiencing out here and what, uh, what uh, Montreal has experienced could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Either of you want to say anything about that? Lisa, you go first. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, I, the bike infrastructure in Montreal is incredible. I've I've used it myself, and I, I Victoria is a really really weird place. It really it's incredibly you know progressive on the surface. You know, committed to climate action, building an economy for the future, all of those things. You know, as long as it doesn't mean I have to change, as long as it doesn't mean that that road that I'm used to driving on uh, is going to be converted, um, you know, one out of three lanes converted for other people to use. Uh, and, and it's also very interesting, too, because we're, we're a really educated population. Like, I think we've got more post-secondary degrees per capita than almost anywhere else in the country. And so you'd, you'd expect that like even if you just look at it from an economic point of view it is way cheaper uh, and you know here's just an example we spent uh, 3.1 million dollars on one of our corridors that moves something like 3000 people per day and the provincial government is investing 85 million dollars on a road to souk uh, which is one of the western communities well you know that but for others who don't which moves about 3,000 or 4,000 people in and out of town from every day so look at the value for money like you know our, our educated population should get it so you know one of the things that i i saw on before i left social media it was a, a meme and it was like the, it was attributed to afro caribbean punk and the quote was um if you've had privilege equality feels like oppression and I, I think that that's kind of what's happening with the bike lanes. I've been able to drive my car wherever I want. I haven't had to look as carefully, you know, all of those things. And, and, and the bike lanes are a, a very visible, visceral challenge to the status quo of how we move around cities, who cities belong to. You know, right now with the installation of the bike networks, we're seeing way more seniors than ever before biking downtown, way more kids, like five-year-olds biking downtown, unheard of. And so that's kind of a right to the city for people who haven't been able to be safe on the roads before. And, and that challenges the, you know, the able-bodied 45-year-old person who likes to drive their car. So I think that's part of it. The bike lanes are a really visible sign of, of change and, and a disruption to the status quo. 
That was, I think that's very true from what I've seen here. Jennifer, did you want to say anything about the Montreal experience? Yeah, um, um, it, a lot of it happened before um, I was I moved here, Tad. So in a sense, when I arrived, a lot of it was here. It's not been without total controversy. I mean, what's been interesting is that there's also been um, the widening of the bike and pedestrian access um, during COVID, right, to enable, and that has happened quite rapidly. And I know you may know this too, Lisa, that Valerie Plant took a lot of heat for that, that she was accused of not taking um, small business views into account in particular because it changes um, the nature of the environment for them, and also the degree to which um, there was disruption um, to traffic and to uh, you know some businesses as a, resu as a result of the installation. So many were saying, you know, on top of COVID, now it's you know become actually hard temporarily, but hard temporarily to reach uh, my business because of some of the changes that have been made. But I suspect you know part of what um, makes the traffic flow and the use of cars different here is that there is such a highly developed public transportation network um, and so much that happens on foot. The core of the city is actually very, very small. And um, because it, the reach of the metro is much I think it's much better than the Toronto Metro, for example. Uh, the Toronto Metro is improving but it's very much like a European metro system where you live very comfortably without a car. Uh, and so that means that, you know, the level of disruption, um, as you were referring to Lisa, in terms of, you know, the visceral, this changes my life, um, has, has been less dramatic. Mm -hmm. So we come back to the issue of functionality and, uh, and as, a, as a core, uh, starting point for the legitimacy of democratic democratic yeah. governments. I, we are now well past time, and so I think we need to wrap up. I want to thank you all so much, also for your patience, uh, patience with me and my disruption here. Lisa, thank you for uh, stepping in. I, I, I didn't want to ask you to be the chair of yet another meeting because I know that's all you do. <laughs> it just comes so naturally that it just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, what do you say? I'll do it. I thought, oh, yes. You can do the territorial acknowledgement and everything. And it's just, <laughs> so thank you so much to all of you. And uh, we haven't, we, you know, I think we've, We've not, uh, we could talk for hours about this very productively, obviously, and the questions, I'm sorry to the people who, whose questions haven't been answered because they're very good questions there. Um, but I, I, think, uh, I think it's a story still to be told. I mean, there's obviously some enormous challenges for democratic governance, whether it's local or regional or national. Uh, um, but we've talked enough about possibilities for reform or improvement or mitigation of some of these challenges that there are some avenues that people can pursue in thinking about positive possibilities. I just finished a book about hope. So I'm always looking for positive possibilities. And we've had a few scattered through our conversation here, enough, enough to give me some hope for uh, democracy yet. So thank you all so much. And thank you very much to Victoria Forum and all the wonderful organizers in the background who have made this possible. And all the best for the rest of your days. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ted. Bye, everyone.